text is close to your heart, perhaps closer than you realize. So let me start with a story. I was about 30. I was living in Central Square, Cambridge, kind of on the MIT side of the line. It was a very mixed area. Uh, the housing was a little bedraggled, and I'd found a much treasured rent-controlled apartment <laughs> that I shared with two roommates. We lived right across from one of the older housing projects in the city. And one night, by accident, I left a knapsack in the back of my car, locked it, came inside, and it was only hours later that I realized I'd left the knapsack in the car and went out and guess what I found? A little pile of cubes of glass on the back seat and the knapsack was gone. It wasn't much of a car, but it was a little bit sporty. It was a Datsun B210, well, kind of a hatchback. It was white, and it had been noticed. And maybe a month later, it disappeared. Of course, I thought I'd forgotten where I parked it. No, it was gone. <laughs> and so the police report the looking, the wondering, and then one day a streetwise friend from church went for a walk in my neighborhood and called me up and said, I found your car. So I walked not more than about two blocks around the back of the block I lived on, and there was my little Datsun B210. It was open, it had been hot-wired, and on the car itself was spray-painted the letters T-I-Z-B-O-N-E, Tisbone. Tisbone. Well, the car had been not to get up, and I began to try to get advice about what to do. Not much of the advice was very helpful, but one friend said to me, you know, I think you should take a little oil in a cup, and you should walk through that neighborhood prayerfully and anoint the neighborhood for healing. Well, this morning I want to wrestle with the meaning of the provocative little word, enough. To say enough invites us to welcome life differently. It's so simple, the word enough, perhaps beautiful and simple and I would suggest necessary for our faith. And yet, when used as an adjective with a certain tone of voice, this word enough conjures up for me Psalm 131, where the psalmist describes himself as a, a little child in her mother's arms. Settled, safe, and feeling as though the world, and especially her mother's love, is enough. So I think of the great stories of our faith built on this idea as stories that nourish our hearts, bring us to a, a new place, actually. Think of the great Jewish story of manna in the wilderness, a story, as you know, about enough, the strange manna showing up day by day. When hoarded, it would go bad, but allowed to emerge day by day, it was enough. And I'm sure that when Jesus encountered a crowd in the wilderness, he was calling forth that ancient story so powerful that there would be enough. And that's what he invited from God the Father that day. The feeding of the 5,000. So the word enough brings a kind of simplicity, and I think it brings a beauty to our sacraments, frankly. Let's think about baptism. Baptism, the story of Jesus' baptism, the, the, the foundation of our own baptisms. Jesus, who stood with others wanting to cleanse their hearts of whatever it was, brought them to that desolate place. Jesus, who stood next to his cousin and was baptized and came up out of the water and heard these words, you are my beloved son. I am very pleased 
with you. Don't you hear enough in that? The beauty of enough, the beloved, loved by God. Enough. I think this word enough would haunt Jesus' ministry. I am enough. Or as we'll find out in just a moment, you, as you go out, are enough. Enough within the disciples as they go out to meet the world and bring who they are to that world. Enough. And finally, I think our whole vision of covenant brings that sense of enough to our hearts as well. You know, the ancient idea of covenant was that this was a completely secure and solid relationship. In our faith, secured by God, he gives it to us. And Jesus re-energized that idea, walked it through his life, took it to the cross, and allowed us to drink in the simplicity of God's enough for us at every point. Modeled that, spoke of that, and then gifted it to us. So the word enough has this simplicity of a child in a parent's arms, has the beauty of our sacraments, and it has this necessity of covenant as part of it the foundation of our faith. And then we see enough inspiring, I think, the way in which Jesus sent his disciples out. And while we didn't read this passage, it comes right before our passage about the good enough Samaritan. In this instruction, set of instructions, Jesus sends his followers in pairs to villages and he says, go and don't take extra with you. Don't take an extra pair of shoes. What you have is enough. And when a house receives you, go and stay there and let their food be enough for you. And do what you can. Heal and cast out what is evil. And when you leave, leave with God's peace on your lips for them. It seems to me in some ways what Jesus was saying to this learned man, this lawyer who wanted to test him, come and be part of outgoing love of God, which is enough for the world. Well, my roommates and I were not aware of living in fear on the streets because we were good at compartmentalizing life. We walked past Newtown Court every day. And yet it was, I think, in our minds and hearts, miles away. We didn't know about our neighbors. So finally, on an April morning, a few months later, I decided to take my friend's advice and to take a little bit of oil in a tiny cup. I felt a little odd, but there I was. I walked into that space where I wondered if I was really invited. I felt like an intruder, actually, a little bit, probably because of the way we were living as non neighbor Watch little kids, I chose a safe hour of 8 o'clock in the morning, getting on the school bus. And then, especially, to look over one, at one basement door where I noticed in black spray paint those familiar letters, T-I-Z-B-O-N-E. And it was just this amazing moment of transformation for my, for, my, <laughs> for my heart because it was this moment when I saw that the fears I'd been living with actually resided in a particular place with particular people and that probably it was a group of teenagers who were a club as much as a gang. The Tisbonites probably were meeting in a social room in the basement of one of those apartments. And yes, someone had dared someone to do something, and my car had disappeared. You know, the parables of Luke especially, and I think it's probably because he was so missional in his experience of the church, 
challenge us to consider our frame of reference, kind of where we start from, how we look at the world. And this parable and the, good, and, and the prodigal son both get us to do that. And I do think there's a way in which this parable of the good Samaritan is about the good enough Samaritan, the one who could go with what he had and share that as he could and come away feeling that he was the conduit somehow of God's grace and God's love. Now, I've always loved this chapter of Luke, but it came to sort of haunt me as well in in the last two months. As some of you know, I entered the the passageway of hospice with my mother, uh, May 1st. And for the month of May, I was with my siblings, with her in in different ways, through about four and a half weeks of her own journey through hospice. It was an interesting experience. It was a deep experience. And it was a powerful experience of what I would say to myself, this is like encampment, a kind of going and being there. My sister and I live, you know, about two hours away from the Middletown area of Connecticut. And so we'd go down for a couple of days, three, four days at a time. And I noticed as I came back that I was really tired. And I think it was because I was exploring what what enough it was I was bringing and realizing that all you can do is bring yourself at a moment like that. And that is the enough. Quite, quite an experience, you know, mo- the moment of being with someone. One of my little tools was um, a little black uh, Bluetooth speaker, and it allowed whatever it was my mom wanted to listen to to be amplified enough, so whether it was music or a podcast or a documentary on Andrew Wyeth's life, it was something we could listen to. She didn't want to speak. It was just too difficult for her. But that little speaker gave us a shared moment. Well, all the preconceptions of what you're going to do, I think, fly out the window when you actually go through this experience. And in the last week, I came to appreciate the hospice-trained nurses. One in particular, Mary Lou. And Mary Lou had a way of touching, a way of stroking my mom's forehead and a way of showing us how to be present. It was lovely, it was beautiful. In its simplicity and its power, it was, it, was, it was what I needed actually. It was a beautiful thing. So I came away from that experience wondering about this word. I thought about it of course before, but I find myself wondering where does that word show up in our lives? And I do think it shows up in those places where we are a little out of our depth, where we are on the road in some way towards something we don't know about. Uh, it, may be, it may be a simple challenge in life. It may be a someone who shows up that we don't know how to meet exactly. It may be that we're confined a little and walk 200 steps in a day, or it may be that we walk 10,000 steps in our day. We may be at home or on the road, literally. But I think there are moments when we discover that we are in some way beyond ourselves and in some way meeting the spirit of Jesus again where we go. I wonder what that is for you. Um, I couldn't not speak of where I've been, and yet every day has its own moments. They're small, many of them. I don't think they're all large. But they're moments of change. They're moments of upset sometimes. They're moments of unexpected beauty. Whatever it is, we're out of our depth in some way. And the grace of God comes back to to haunt us and find us. I loved 
Elizabeth describing prevenient grace, that grace that goes ahead of us. I think that we're seeing that in this passage. Um, Christiane talked about the surprising quality of grace last week. That's the same thing, really. <clears throat> what is the grace of these moments? I think it's really the grace that we are part of something bigger, not just as a problem, but as an opportunity. There's something more. There's another helper. There's something more. We're aware of God in some new way. There's something more. The person we're with reaches back with a gift. I think in some ways we ought to interrogate this story and ask both the Jewish victim and the, and the Samaritan, what did you learn? What did you gain? What was it like to touch and be touched? So I think all of these moments, they remind us that we're not the whole thing, but we are part of something big, it's part of something wonderful. We are stepping into God's enough, into Jesus' style and vision of life. We're stepping into mission and service and even more importantly, than mission and service. We're stepping into presence, for God is there.